Well, good morning, everyone. This is the day the Lord hath made, and we will rejoice and be what? Amen. Amen. There you go. Now, I did bring my coffee, and I wondered where I put it. All right. I am a coffee drinker, so if that's, uh, if that's not good for you, I love tea, too. My family sent us some, some wonderful things. I want to say on camera, thank you for the gifts. We got some early Christmas presents and things like that. And so one of the things I like is hot, spicy food. How many know that about Pastor Kerry? Amen. And it's okay because those that like hot, spicy food, you're cool too. Amen. Amen. I know there's several of, of you like really hot, hot peppers and stuff. And I don't know why I like them. But I want to say thank you to my children, especially Brent. He sent me some habana, uh, habanero lime chips. Oh, those were good. I haven't finished them yet. And then he sent me some uh, ghost pepper uh, blue diamond uh, almonds. See, California is kind of like the almond capital down there. And blue diamond has really done some different works, kind of like Tabasco has finally expounded and went into different areas. And I wanted to thank BJ, too, because it's Christmas time, for that, uh, telling us about that, um, that uh, sriracha, you know, and of course, it's a Christian organization, so we can go ahead and say Chick-fil-A sriracha sauce is really good. If you haven't tried it, here's a little blessing on that, you know. Is the camera need to be adjusted? All right. Amen. So let's go ahead. You ready? You got your Bibles? Got your notepads? Amen. We've been doing a series called Reigning in Life in Christ. So this morning, being Christmas, as we approach Christmas, the time the world celebrates the birth of Christ. We know when he was really born, pretty much. But we celebrate the birth of Christ because it's always good to celebrate Jesus, right? What did the Father say? He said, Lord, if you lift my son up, I'll draw men unto you. Amen. So in our daily conversations, in our going through our routines, lift Jesus up. Amen. Share. Great season to share. Amen. And then the subtitle is called, Unto Us a Child Was Born. So we're going to turn around and read our scripture here in a minute. I'm, they can go ahead and bring it up if they can. But I want to read my paragraph. So blessings to you, family of God. We're going to be talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to talk about how he was a gift. And the great gamble that God the Father went through just to get him to be born in this earth. And remember, Adam gave the earth up to the enemy. And the enemy, in confronting Jesus in the temptations, he says, he took Jesus up into a mountain, he said, and showed him all the kingdoms of the earth. And he says, all these I'll give you if you fall down and worship me. You bow down and worship me. What did Jesus say? Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall you serve. So we know that the enemy took Adam's authority and had Adam's authority all through the Old Testament. That's why it was very difficult 
for God to get his son into the earth because he had to do it legally. He had to do it according to the scripture and according to the prophets. They're prophesying God into the earth. So God came in, his son came in on the volume of the book which was written of him. So we see a little bit here, a little bit there. We first prophecy was Genesis 3.15. It says would be the seed of a woman that would bruise your head. Now women don't have seed, they have eggs. Can you say amen? In, in, a, in a manner of speaking, we have some young people watching. Amen. So the man has the, uh, the, the seed and the woman has the egg and, and then life is created by God. So the spirit and the soul come into the, the ovum and the, egg and the sperm and it creates you and I. But when Jesus was born, he could not have the bloodline be corrupted because everybody in Adam was fallen. So we're under the curse of sin. So God had to bypass the bloodlines, and the bloodlines are passed through the mail on and on and on and on, you see. And so Jesus was born of the Spirit by the decree of God in his word. Amen. And so we're going to get through there. Unto us a child was born. So you ready? All right. Now Luke chapter 2, verse 8 through 14. Now there were in the same count, country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were greatly afraid. I would be too. Size of those angels are huge. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there will be born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is called Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was, a, there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts Praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill to men. Now these shepherds were like wise guys, wisdom. They would sit out there and they would contemplate and hear God saw fit to reveal to the lowly his coming and his, his purpose and plan in the birth of his son Jesus Christ. Say amen. So we're going to be studying and sharing just a little bit how important it is for Jesus to be born in the flesh. Not only was he God, but he was man. We call that, if you go to Bible college, and most of us haven't, but I did. I learned one word that I held on for a long time, and it took me a while to explain this. But did you know that Jesus is an enigma? He's a hypostatic, hypostatic union. i got to say it right. That means he's all God and all man. All man and all God. At times he's referred to as the man Christ Jesus. And other times Christ Jesus. Now Christ is not his last name. It means Messiah. The coming Messiah. Jesus the Messiah. Can you say amen? And we know Jesus in the Hebrew is Yahshua. Amen. Which means Savior. Savior Jesus our Messiah. Can you say amen? And the good news is, he came to the lowly, the shepherds. And he says, look, lying in the manger. Now, just so you know, that manger was an outcropping of rock. I've been there. Right above it, we, we dined in a restaurant. That's where I saw the, the grapes as big as uh, grapefruit, you know. Anyway, so it's an outcropping. It wasn't even built with wood or anything that you would imagine. And it was open, it was colder out, and there was no room for the inn. Now, you got to realize that God wanted his son to be born in obscurity, out of the eyesight of what the enemy is doing. And he remembered that God, and we're going to study this today, that God hid his son, keeping the serpent from destroying him before his time. 
Remember the prophecy in Genesis 3.15? It said it would be the seed of the woman that would crush your head. Hello? And so Satan went right off and started going after the righteous, godly people. Let me ask you, see if you remember, who was the first murder in the Bible? Cain killed Abel. Why? The devil thought Abel was going to crush his head. So he had Cain get jealous and to be in the flesh and kill his brother. Hello. And then we can follow the serpent seed chasing what he thinks is the Messiah all through the Bible, all through the Old Testament, trying to murder and stop the will of God. Now, I want to let you know, because you might not know this, but he almost succeeded in Solomon's line. How many wives did Solomon have? How many concubines? That means adultery repair. A lot. So there was something wrong with Solomon, so he got himself, because of sin, now please, God doesn't give up on anybody, but he must be legally, follow his word. And legally, he can't help somebody, they don't call on God. So Solomon started off with God, he got so blessed, success might ruin somebody, hello, and he got so full of himself, Finally, it says it was all vanity, vanity. Now, you might say, well, was Solomon saved? Well, I would say only God knows who's got, who made it and who didn't make it. Uh, but I believe he probably went, but he went with great sorrow. Because how many know the love of money is the root of all evil? And it corrupted him. So in Solomon's bloodline, his bloodline could not bring forth a messiah. So it's prophesied there would be a seed of a woman. It would come through the bloodline of Abraham through to the, the lordship and the throne of David all the way through until Messiah was born. Now we have two accounts of how that's lined up. You can read it in Luke, how the different lineages are, and you can read it in Matthew. One starts from the beginning and goes up to Mary, and the other one starts from Mary from Joseph and goes all the way back to the beginning. To show us, to show us how the seed was protected and the bloodline. Hello. Now, what would have happened if Jesus would have made a mistake? It would have disqualified him. So, well, you say, oh, man, thank God it was Jesus, because I, pl I made plenty of mistakes. Amen. Are you still with me? We're going to cover these four areas. Okay, you ready? If you're taking notes. Number one, the bloodline and the back door. God protected the bloodline and Jesus came in through the back door. Two, how, do, how Jesus eluded the destroyer. We're going to talk about the eluding of the destroyer. Because remember, the serpent's going to chase his heel, going to try to stop Jesus from dying for our sin. Thirdly, Mary receiving the seed. How the seed was received? How did she receive Jesus? Into her heart and into her womb. And then fourthly, we must be about our Father's business. Hello? When Jesus, remember, he was with his family and they went to the synagogue and and all of a sudden, in the place, the marketplace, because it was close to the celebration, right? And, you know, the great uh, Sabbath, you know. And everybody was there in Jerusalem and everything. And Jesus somehow separated from his family. What was he doing? He was preaching the word, even at an early age. Hello? And immediately, you got to figure out, it must have been a, a, a grand time because mom and dad Where's Jesus? Oh, no. You know what I mean? And they, they found him. And then they said, what are you doing here? I'm paraphrasing. Forgive me, though. What are you doing? He says, I must be about my father's business, right? Let me ask you, how are you doing? Are you about your business? Or are you about the father's business, too? Can you say amen? Now, I'm not trying to put you down because you're business people, you have wonderful lives, you have a family and all that, and you're to be about those things. But you're also to be about the Father's business. Can you say amen? Because you're born again and you're saved. God kept you from hell. 
And so just out of that and our, out of our love for God, we should be willing to share Jesus with anybody and everybody that we come to uh, face to face with. Now, sometimes God might have us not to, depending on if it's going to create a problem or not. So I like during this time, um, I know that there's a lot of stuff keeping people from traveling from their families, but I like at this time to share Christ with my family. And you know what? None of us are as close to God as we really want to be. And it's not to put us down, but we all want to get closer to God. So it's always good to share an encouraging word to another brother and sister to help him, Lord, grow in the Lord. Say amen. All right, so you ready? First point. The blood, the bloodline, and the back door. So go with me again to the prophecy in Genesis 3.15. I'll just quote it for you. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, this is God speaking to the serpent, and between your seed or offspring and her seed and offspring. You shall bruise, uh, he shall bruise your head, in other words, crush your authority, break your power, and you shall bruise his heel. You will chase him around, trying to keep him from doing what he's doing. Now, the Bible tells us that God hid Jesus many times away from the, the terror of the people, from the enemy being able to capsulate him. Hello? Amen. He would slip out of their midst. Many times Jesus would go up into a place and pray to his father. Every day he would walk with his father. He would pray to his father first thing. And if Jesus is our model and example, we need to be doing the same thing. Say amen. All right. So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 through 10. Now, this is Paul speaking to the Corinthians, and he's saying some powerful things. He's saying, for the Christian child of God, listen carefully, God wants to teach you not by men, but by his spirit. In other words, he wants to give us revelation knowledge out of the view of Satan, out of the view of the enemy and his workings, right to our heart and our spirit, because we're a spirit person. God is a spirit, and we receive the word of God by him revealing it to us. That's what revelation means. It means God revealing the word to us. Now, we can read it, we can meditate on it, and let me encourage you to do that. But every once in a while, as you're reading along, suddenly something comes up and alive. That is God revealing to you what you need to know at this date, at this time. So get in the Word of God so that He can reveal to us. Now, it's harder for God to reveal things to us if we're not in the Word. Because He, use, he is the Word and He uses the Word. And the reason being is, He has to use then physical things to teach us. Jesus often did that in the parables. He talked about sowing, fishing. He talked about different things. Can you say, to relate to people, to paint pictures for them. But we have to be in the Word so God can pull it off the page and bring it into our understanding so that you and I can become what? Doers of the Word of God. Say amen. In God, God's thrilling. I love this. So it says, however, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age or world, not the ruler, because, nor the rulers of this age. Now listen to this. Who are coming to nothing. How many know those leaderships without God? Everything's coming to nothing. But he who does the will of God shall abide forever. As we continue to read on. Who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. A hidden teachings. Only by the spirit. The hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages. For our glory. For whose glory? For our glory. God wants to reveal to us what we lost in the garden. Which none, listen to this, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they had known this wisdom, they not have crucified the Lord of glory. So you see, God been, was hiding Jesus all this time. And you know, every time that the enemy catch wind, remember the devil's not always present. He's only limited. Okay? There are twice as many angels, twice as much godly things in this planet now for us 
than there are for the, for the enemy. The reason is that God is passive aggressive. We have to invite him. We have to ask him. We have to get involved with him for him to operate. Hello? Even with my own father. I knew my father. I had a good father. I was fortunate. that He was supportive. My mother was very supportive. Some of you know, know my parents. But at the same time, it wasn't until later on that I really got to know my father. You see, it's just like that with Jesus. We accept him. We love him. But it takes a while for us to really develop a relationship. This is what the enemy, why the enemy gives so many distractions. And he tries to write us with problems so that we won't settle in and really get to know our father and our family. Can you say amen? And so, thank God you're doing that. You're getting to know your father. You're interchanging, interacting with him throughout your day through Jesus Christ. Amen? Say amen again. All right. So, and it says, listen, it's very important we do that. He says, because none of the rulers, he hid it from all the rulers. Now he quotes the reason why the rulers missed this. Look at the next scripture. I has not seen, nor uh, ear heard, nor has entered the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God, everyone say, but God, has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searcheth all things, yes, the deep things of, of God. Now, the Holy Spirit's likened unto a dove. That means he's gentle. So you can't be all fleshy and carnal and think you're going to approach God that way. You have to be humble and loving. When you do, the Holy Spirit gives you a guided tour and really helps us. So we seek to be like Jesus and to love the Lord. And any time we start to, you know, get edgy or start to blow it, just stop. Ask the Lord, oh, Lord, I need some help now. And he'll begin to get you so aware and so knowledgeable about God. Your life will take on a rhythm and a flow of the Spirit. Now, I want to let you know, the last 20 years, unless you had a really deep, deep, deep relationship, relationship with God, the church, I don't know what happened to it, but it was doing fine about 20 years ago. But all of a sudden, it got its focus off of God, off of what God wants done, and onto the problems and the disagreements and onto the situation, who's right, who's wrong, and, you know, that happened in Jesus' time. Jesus, the, the disciple, wanted to know who was going to be the great one under Jesus. Remember, they argued who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom. You see, the enemy is very crafty because if he can know he can get Christian brothers and sisters fighting and arguing and doing all that silly stuff, the church becomes powerless. Hello? Instead, you and I, we're going to start a new breed. Actually, there are many, many churches that are now focused on God again. They have forbid their people to talk about others and, and to gossip and all that. And their lives are turning around. The church is getting on fire again. Isn't that amazing that we can be so mature to pay attention to what God actually asks us to do? Come on, laugh with me a bit. But God has revealed them to us by his spirit. The spirit searcheth all things, yes, the deep things of God. So if you want to know a deeper walk, a deeper thing with God, who do you get to buddy up with? The Holy Spirit. Everyone say, Holy Spirit, teach me to be your buddy. It's okay to say that. It's not disrespectful because we know a buddy means a good close friend. Say amen. And aren't they important to have somebody that you can talk with? The Holy Spirit's here for that reason. Jesus said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet a little while I'll be gone, but then I'll send my spirit to you. He will guide you into all truth. He will teach you concerning me, and he will show you your future. Get to know him. Amen. Remember, it's not what we're taught. It's what we practice and what we catch and practice what produces in our life. What's producing in your life is your parts, the part that you're doing the word of. And remember, God is encouraging it along the way. All right. A couple of points. God who dwells, God who dwells in the beginning and, and knows the ending from, from the beginning dwells in you and I's heart. If we listen to him, 
He can guide our steps and we won't trip up so much. Some, someone say amen. Two, so God said to the serpent, I will put enmity or division between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise your head, crush your head, and your authority, and you shall chase his heel. So look at the effort the enemy went through in the Old Testament to try to snuff out the birth of the seed. Everywhere. All the time. Constantly harassing the Israelites. Constantly causing problems. <coughs> Excuse me. Two. Excuse me. Three. Look at the effort the enemy is doing. Try to stop the Messiah by what? By, by affecting people's minds. How did Cain kill Abel? Well, he allowed the devil to sit right on his brain. And told him, your brother is evil. Your brother's, and he just filled him with jealousy. Think about it. How, what happens to us when we dwell on the wrong things? Hello? Now, it's the same thing. But how long? How do people get so corrupted? Well, they never stop from dwelling on the wrong things. In fact, during the time of Noah, it says that men's heart had evil with them always, continually. They couldn't even think about doing anything good. That's how corrupt they came. But thank God you and I know better. Whatever is good, whatever is perfect, whatever is just, whatever is holy, whatever brings a good report. The Bible says in Philippians 4, 8, think, make yourself think on these things. All right, you with me? All right, point two, protection eluding the destroyer. God protected and shielded Jesus, and he still shields you and I. The problem is it's not being taught in the church like it needs to be, that you have a protection, a kingdom, and a shielding that comes only by God. Not only are you in God, not only is God in you, but you are with God, and God is for you. So that means you're totally shielded if you walk in Christ, right? The trouble is we get shot at when we're not in Christ. And a lot of Christians are not in Christ as much as they should be. So don't get all upset about that. Just get into under the shield in, within your head. Say amen. All right, Genesis chapter uh, 15, verse 1. Protection eluding the destroyer. In Genesis 15, verse 1, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your what? Shield and your exceeding great reward. He's going to make a covenant with this man. Remember, God was kicked off the planet. Just to share this with you. And in order for God to get involved, this is very important. He has to be asked. Have you ever noticed God did not throw himself on you, knock you down and save you? You had to really come to a place where you needed to ask for, for God to help you. Say amen. Well, in the Old Testament, it was terrible because there was hardly any light. That's why it says, then the light cometh into darkness. And the darkness can't comprehend it. Why? Because Satan had again corrupted the planet just before the birth of Christ. Did you know there's 400 years between Malachi and Matthew where God was working but undercover and there was so much evil going on in the planet until the shepherds saw and we heard that Jesus was coming and he will be born in Bethlehem. Amen. Anyway, just get beyond that a little bit now. We need to see what happens. So, God shielded Abraham and his covenant so he could get Jesus into this planet. Go with me to Psalms 18, verse 30 through 32. As for God, his way is perfect. Don't forget that. That's your eyeglasses. If it's not perfect, slow down and figure out what's going on. His way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in him. Do you trust in him today? For who is God except the Lord? 
And who is a rock except our God? It is God who arms me with strength and makes my way perfect. Beautiful scripture, right? As you can tell, this is also about Jesus. God is protecting him so that he can fulfill his call. Now listen, is God respecter of persons? So listen, when you choose to get up every morning, present yourself to God and say, God, I want to be used of you, God will start using you. And remember, he will protect you whenever you're being used of God. Because you don't do it without God, you do it with God, and God does it through you. So how can the enemy approach when God is present? The idea is well, we have to be exercised in, in this way of thinking because this is who we really are in Christ. But the enemy has been hiding these truths so that you and I can't enjoy or come to a place of rest and rhythm with God. He wants us always to be struggling, always to have this, and always to have that. That is not God's life. That is not God's fullness. He says you shall have life and have it to its fullness. So there must be a place that we can be in God, where we can literally receive the victories and the, and the things that he said are ours. In order to find that, we've got to make God first in everything we do. Remember, he's on our side. He wants the best for us. He's not going to keep us from enjoying our life. He's going to help us to enjoy it safely without the struggles of the flesh and evil. Are you with me? A couple of points. Church, we know that our Heavenly Father had to shield the eyes of the enemy to keep him from seeing where Jesus was. Also, he sent confusion into his followers. And they're still confused today. Did you know the demons and the fallen angels that are working in the planet? Remember, the planet's a prison. They can't go up there in space like everybody's trying to say, oh, they're ancient aliens. No. If you if really, yeah, they are alien to the planet, but now they're locked here. They, Satan can't go anywhere. And if you read his demise... He's going to be chained up in the lake of fire for eternity. And if you read the Bible careful enough, you'll find out the lake of fire is right under your feet. It's in the earth. It's a prison. Remember I told you the earth was a prison. Satan caused that. And mankind was captuated in that prison until Jesus came. All the people that believed in God before Jesus came went to a special holding chamber. Still in hell. It was called Abraham's bosom or paradise. Remember, that was one of the places Jesus went and preached to. He says, hey boys, girls, I'm leading captivity captive. And I'm giving gifts of men. And he led all people out of Abraham's bosom that were righteous with Christ. And that's called the first resurrection. And in Matthew, it says the graves are opened. And they went in and they visited some of the people. So, Unless Jesus rose first, none of us have any hope. But aren't you glad that we have a way, a truth, and a life to live in Jesus' name? All right. We can follow the bloodline of Jesus Christ all the way through to the promise of Abraham, all the way through, all the way up into the birth of Jesus Christ. Three, yet we are to go into all the world and to give Jesus away. And that's what's wrong with the church. I'm really convinced. Now you might throw me out of here. But you might not. I'm convinced the church has problems. When they focus too much about themselves. Their programs. Now look I'm not just talking generally here. When we're focused on ourselves. If you remember the book of Revelations. The book as, as John writes to the church at Ephesus. He says I know your works. And I know your love. But you forgot one thing. You're so busy doing things, you forgot your first love and really meeting with God. Remember that? Amen. I believe the church today is so busy trying to get their church to become big and try to be getting filled. And of course, all of us want that. But sometimes we can miss our focus. Hello. Sometimes when we're receiving things from God, and listen, this is for you guys. 
we can so bad want to receive healing and all that. Our, our focus is on us wanting to receive it instead of receiving it. I'm going to pause for a minute until that settles in. You see, as long as we are engaged in trying to do something, God is not. But as long as we back up and say, Lord, I asked you to get engaged and make my life whole, then you need to rest in him and know and thank him because he's on the job doing that very thing. The, the thing is, sometimes we don't see natural things change right away. And often the changes happen inside where you can't see them. Listen to me carefully. And then they spread all the way through the outside. So when you ask God for changes, he does all the changes in your soul and inside you. And as you learn those truths and begin to act on them, it comes out and manifests. So you receive all the word concerning your healing. You meditate on it. You think about it. You pray about it. You believe you receive it. And you don't even bother doing anything until that seed grows up and becomes mature. And then when you start seeing yourself healed, go forward and get your, seat, your healing. Hello? Hope you got that. Another point I want to give you is, every, even today, we are shielded from the enemy. Do you believe that? Told you about your hedge. Everybody that's a human being born in the earth, you say, why human being? Well, there's other animals born in the earth. You know, I'm not talking about people that were born in the earth. And God has a salvation plan for every human being. Do, they, do, they all, do all humans get saved? No. Do all humans get healed? No. They have to want and ask. You have to ask God to get involved in your life. Now, Satan has done a whole big job of keeping people confused about God and religion. Many people don't ask Jesus in their heart because they got religion confused with Jesus. They think they have to give up this. They think they have to give up that. They think they have to do this, feel sorry for their sin. And frankly, they just don't want to do any of that. But see, that's not, see, that's the lie. The lie is just surrender and ask God to help you live your life. Then he will throw out of your life what isn't good for you. Hello? You're looking at me all kind of cross-eyed. You go to God and let him make those changes. Let God well up and grow up in you. And pretty soon, he'll start causing you to shed the things, the weights and the sin that so easily besets you. And then your walk starts getting smoother. And you start getting in the groove. And you start moving in the spirit. And power starts happening. Because you're not so hung up on yourself. Everyone look at their neighbor and say, Hey, don't be so hung up on yourself. Bless your heart. Amen. All right, let's go to our next point, our third point. Mary received the seed. Now, how she received the seed is exactly how we're to receive the seed. Who's the seed? All right, Jesus. But who's the seed? Let me just get to the point. The word of God. And a man soweth the seed, soweth the word. So the word and Jesus are one. Jesus and the word are one. So guess what? Our job is to go into all the world and preach the seed, the gospel. But how did she receive the seed? The same way you and I receive it. So let's look at it. Go with me to Luke chapter 1, verse 26 through 38. Kind of read fast. That's good copy, honey. Now it says, now in the sixth month, of the angel Gabriel was sent by God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man. Notice this betrothed to a man. Joseph was much older than Mary, being only 13 years old or so. Betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. Remember, the line has to come through David, right? And through the promise of Abraham, through the line of David, the bloodline has to is corrupted now. But yet still God wants to bring the Messiah. Are you still with me? To a virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, 
the angel said to her, remember, they're passive aggressive. Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. What you don't know is Mary was of the bloodline of David, of the promise of Abraham. She is the woman that Jesus spoke in Genesis 3.15 that it would be the seed of a woman that would bring forth and crush Satan's head. Now remember, she was only about 13. A virgin. Women don't pass the blood. The male passes the blood. So there was no male involved in the birth of Christ. What happened? How was it done? We have an account of it right here. And it says in verse 29, But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and, and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son. And shall call his name Jesus. What shall we call his name? There's no other name given among men where we must be saved. Not Yahweh. Not Jehovah. Jesus. Say amen. Even Yahshua, that would work. Or, you know, Jesus if you're Spanish. But it's the name of Jesus that we're to respect. Okay? Hello, you with me? He shall be called Jesus. All right. And then it goes on. I got to find my place here. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. The house of Jacob is talking about, remember Jacob? wrestled with God and his name was changed. That's a type and shadow of the church. How we were away from God, how we wanted to be blessed, and we weren't Jewish. Well, J Jacob, Jacob was the surplanter. He was the thief, the robber, and his life changed when he accepted God. Say amen. You go back and read about it. Then verse 34, then Mary, now this is what I want you to see. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I know not a man? I'm going to turn my page here for you. And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you, and therefore also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, and then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, listen to what she said. Let it be done unto me according to your word. That's when the seed went into her, her womb. Remember, it wasn't until you said, Jesus, come into my life, that he came in. Hello? So she heard the angel, she heard the word, and she said, I know not a man, but be it done according to your word. She gave God opening and God came in, didn't it? And then right in her womb, Jesus became flesh. A little embryo. Hello. Nine months and then the birth of our Savior. A couple of points I want to give you. Notice that Mary was the woman that the seed would be born from. Out of the line of David from the promises of Abraham. Two, the enemy was taken off guard and missed the whole opportunity. Why? Because he wasn't smart enough to remember it would be the seed of a woman. Hey, you dummy. Seed of a woman. So remember, the devil is very, very world wise. But he's not spiritually smart. Now, please get the understanding. You are a child of God, and God wants you to operate in the Spirit so you can be spiritually wise and smart above His level because God's operating with you. But you see, if we operate in the natural, Satan's already pre-programmed some of us, and he's already put some of those little junk things that we've got in our thinking. 
So that's why Paul says, get out of the natural. Don't be carnal. Don't walk in the flesh. Because when you do, you're easy pickings. The devil can smell you. He can see that you're not where you should be. How does the devil know when to attack your countenance? The negative stuff that comes out of our mouth. Well, that's killing me. I'm dying if I do. I'm dying if I don't. Gee, I could laugh till I was dead. What? 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 Listen to people talk sometime. You want an education? Just be, choose to be quiet and go hang around some people. Listen what comes out of their mouth. We are a product of the ton total of what we say during the day. You are a product of the total of what you say during the day. So say not what you should not and say what you should. Woohoo! I done preached myself happy. Let's get on to this last point. We must be about our Father's business. Go with me, Matthew 28, please. How many here are children of God? Wave your hands at me. Say, I'm pleased to be with God. Absolutely. Bless you. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Actually, let's start at verse 16. You'll see the Great Commission. We've been commissioned to go give Jesus out. The church gets stale when they stop giving Jesus out and start working on their own stuff. Well, listen. All of you have a, a form of ministry. You're all involved in ministry. Danny's up there with the sound. But if it's only what Danny wants to do in the sound, everything is going to fall apart. But it's what Danny wants to do for God in the sound. God will bless beyond his wildest dreams. The idea is to keep the, the horses in front of the cart and not push the cart. The cart is God. You don't push him. You flow with him. Say amen. All right. So it says, and Jesus came, all right, in verse 16. Then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee to a mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Verse 18, Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me both in heaven and earth. How much? So the devil gets his from you. You're a human citizen. You belong to be, you were born in the earth. You have authority from just being born in the earth. And that you have Jesus Christ. So what does he do? He quicks you, gets you out of the word, gets you into religion, and then bleeds us of our negativity and uses that energy to come against us and our families. Don't, don't feed the attacks on your family by being such a, a goofball. Look at your neighbor and say, thank God I'm not a goofball. God, once God gets together with us and he really shows us what we're doing and what we're not, some of the church, I'm talking worldwide, are going to find out that they're actually their worst enemy. Satan needed them to beat up their family. Hello? To curse their own groups. No. We were made to bless. So be a blessing. Can you say Amen. All right, so it goes on further to say, so Jesus came and spoke to them, all authority has been given to me both in heaven and earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples, students of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's getting them born again. Because the thief on the cross was never baptized in water, but he still was saved. So it's talking about getting people the first baptism, getting them to know the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now most of the church, I have to say it, cannot even explain who God is. That's very scary to me. After all, we supposedly walk with Him every day. Don't say, oh me. And it says... Baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them. Teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. 
You see, you see a package there. Go into all the world, get them saved, then teach them about the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Make disciples. People that are sold out for God are not going to walk around smelling and acting like the world and calling themselves a Christian. Say, ouch. Let's go to Mark 16 and we'll finish up with you. Mark 16, 14 through 20, here's another view. Now, here I want to, sh I want to sh share something with you. Do I have time to do this? God oh, yeah, okay, I do. How many know there's four Gospels? Each Gospel represents one of the faces in Ezekiel. Okay, a lion and uh, uh, a cattle being a servant. So, Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are four different individuals which... All observe, observe Jesus. Now, I'm holding up a football right here. So we got Matthew here. We got Mark over here. And we got Luke over here. And we've got John over here. They're all looking at Jesus. But from their personality and perspectives. Hello. Now if I was to take a square box or something with pictures on each side. And have four of you stand on it, you're going to tell me what you see. You're going to describe the box and everything, but you're going to describe what you see, how you see it. That's wonderful. Now we have a four gospel, a four square gospel of a perfect description of Jesus Christ so we may know him and that he may continually uh, be in us and walk with him. That we can walk with him and understand him and let the Holy Spirit teach us all about him. Say amen, someone. So he says now, verse 14 of Mark 16, he says, Later he appeared to the eleven as, he, as they sat at the table. And what did he do? He says, oh, guys, I'm so good to see you. No, the word rebuke is a harsh word. They were sitting around licking their wounds and talking about, Oh, poor Jesus, we just, just don't know what's going on. Jesus walks right through the wall and, is, and rebukes their unbelief. Why are you doubting? Folks, how many here know that unbelief is what holds us back from receiving all the good things of God? You don't want to have any unbelief. Hello? And if you do, pray, God, help my unbelief. Remember this? One soldier said, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Okay, so don't throw that out. It doesn't make you bad, you see. Just get rid of unbelief. Say amen. And he said to them, okay, because they did not believe that he had been risen from the dead. Verse 15. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And he who believes and is baptized, as being born again, will be saved. And he who does not believe will be condemned. Condemned with the devil and condemned with the world. Hello, are you with me? And then these signs will follow them that what? Them that are pastors? Them that are apostles? No, you guys. Did you know when you go into an area, let me, let me just mention, Diana, when you go do one of those things, those, to, you know, produce a product and everything, first thing you do is go into the area and bind up any hindering spirits. Remove them there. Ask God to go right on in there and sanctify the place where you're going to set up and where you're going to prosper in his name. So the first thing is we can cast out the controlling spirit of that area. How many know when we advance? How many years have been? I, this is a joke. You have to go to stores. You have to go shop. Before you get there, make sure you bind up the enemy. That's Remember, he dwells in the earth and he wants to keep you from having fun. He wants to keep you from enjoying your family and your friends and your life. And keep you from all the little coupons and all the business deals. Hello? So arrest him, rebuke him, and put him in his place before you get there. That includes your day. That's why you meet with God. Second of all, and they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. Listen, 
Are you spirit filled? Everybody got their tongues, but not everybody uses them. Use your tongues as often as you can. Pastor Kerry, how often do you use your tongues? 80% of the time when I pray. I call out a name and say, Lord, use my tongues to cover that. And I just start praying for them. And God will let me know when it's done. Beep. Move on. Beep. Move on. You see, because he's praying through us and we're praying with him. And if you read Romans 8, it says, Howbeit the Spirit helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit helpeth our infirmities with groanings that cannot be uttered. You read it in the Greek, which means articulate speech that you do not understand. Even to the groaning. So we pray in tongues. What is it doing? It's gathering with our spirit and God against any of our shortcomings, against any of the hindrances of the enemy. Pray in tongues often. Build up your most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Ghost. So cast out the devil. Pray in new tongues, which builds yourself up, gets you ready for ministry. Then it says if you drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt you. Why? Because you're not walking in yourself, you're walking in God. Listen, those of you by camera, you shouldn't worry about the food you eat unless God tells you not to eat it. You should be concerned and screen the people you let in your house, and you should pray. And the reason being is we get often visited by what we call a Trojan horse, where God will jump, where the devil, excuse me, will jump on somebody, try to bring it in and get you all stirred up. And we see families missing today because possibly we need to be praying over our family a little bit more. I'm not saying that's the case, but say the enemy, remember, he's our hinderer. He's our enemy. We have to get him out of the way. Hello? And you know, you get the Christian that doesn't know any better. They'll bump into the enemy and they'll get all frustrated. They say, well, God must be doing this to try to teach me something. Now you've done it. You just laminated that thing on you. You better go to God and get it off. Hello? Are you learning anything, church? Amen. Remember, I'm all about you learning and growing so that you can have a good life with God. I already have one. Have you arrived, Pastor Kerry? Are you kidding me? Every day is a new adventure. Come on, let's go on. Besides... Okay, we can, it says that we drink any deadly thing that shall not hurt us. And it says we shall be able to handle serpents. Now here's one that the enemy tried to hide. To handle serpents, and I shared this a little bit with Tracy being present and being back east. This is not talking about physical serpents. This is talking about the serpent's tactics, tricks, his deceptions. You'll be able to handle them because you know right from wrong. You know God from evil. Hello. And so, if Satan, if the devil can't come to you directly, which he can't, because he has to go through God now, he'll send somebody to represent himself. I usually, he'll jump on somebody or he'll stir up something. Or he'll stir it up, but you have the choice whether to get all stirred up with it or just back away. See, that's how important it is for us to be able to handle serpent's tricks. Because he'll stir people up. He might even stir up your spouse or someone to say the wrong things at the wrong time, just when you're ready to go to church. Hello? And I'm not saying it could be a he or she. It could be any of them. I remember years ago that when I went, used to go in, on a fast, that somebody loved me would purposely cook steak and everything that I loved. Just, she didn't know what she was doing. Hello? We should be able to recognize if something's hindering, something's in the way. Come on. And, and if something's open and ready to go. Hello? Can you stay? You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Amen. And so, remember, you have God. The world doesn't. You're supposed to bring God to the world. God can't bring him himself. He already came. Now he needs for us to bring him. So the, what does the enemy do? 
He gets us off of that idea and onto trying to get our needs met and trying to get our life together and try to do this. Now listen, I'm, I'm playing it up a little bit. So that's the trick. Whose job is to get our life together? God's job is as we surrender to him. We just listen to his instruction, begin to do what he asks us to do. We become doers of the word. But it isn't our job or unwillingness or unwillingness. It's not our willpower. Hello? It's God power. Say amen. And finishing. So we should be able to handle all the tactics of the enemy. Why? Because you know that every good and every perfect gift comes from what? God. So therefore, if something is coming your way and it's not good, it's not an open door, it's not perfect, stop and ask God's wisdom and what to do about it. Just don't plunge on through. Ask. Especially when it comes to important things like jobs, you know, spouse, possible spouse, or being married. These kind of things are very important. Buying a house, you know, all that. All right, and finishing. And besides being able to handle serpents, they, they will lay hands on the sick and they shall what? They shall recover. Now listen, the only reason that happens is you are a conduit. You're a vessel. Who lives in you? Okay. Now, here's the problem. If we walk within ourselves every day and not pray, not read the word, then we're walking in our own strength. We still love God. We're still saved. But we're powerless. We need to be every day filled with God in his presence so that his power is eminent. It's right out there. Can you say amen? Because what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to go into all the world and give Jesus away. Amen? To the children. It says, go preach the gospel to every creature. Hey, my birds got saved. No. <laughs> Actually, I just lost my last bird. She was the most stately, godly bird i ever seen. How can you see that, Pastor Kerry? Because she was a little God answer. You know, because, you know, I don't know. But every time I think about it, I think about what God did with her. Because both parents were gone and she was raised up by God. And you say, well, that's a bird, Pastor Kerry. But think about it. God, who is above all, through all, and in us all, he loves for us to enjoy it. animals and the birds and each other. But there's so much confusion and all the junk out there that it causes a lot of people, we have to refocus on a daily basis. Say amen. How many here know when you're driving, it's not a good thing to be distracted? When we're walking, it's not a very good thing to keep your eyes on your peripheral. Keep your eyes on Jesus, and he will line out your path. If you got something out of that this morning, would you give the Lord a praise? Merry Christmas, dude.